David Brough is a professor of neuroinflammation at the University of Manchester, and he's also a historian of jiu-jitsu, and I'm speaking to him today. David, hello, how are you doing? Hi, Paul. Very well, thank you. Great to speak to you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So you have um, an article in issue 10 of Martial Arts Studies, which is on the, the early history of jiu-jitsu in Britain. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lovely, it's very well researched article, really interesting, um, uh, really fascinating. What got you as a, so you're a scientist by, by your profession, um, you're a jiu-jitsu pra practitioner, I'm guessing, I think you are. Why, why did you choose to write um, an article about the history of jiu-jitsu and taking time out from all of your, your professional articles in, in chemicals and chemistry and neuroprocesses and all the rest of it? Well, okay, so it's a, <laughs> that's a good place to start, I suppose. I was always, I, I've always had a, a keen kind of amateur interest in history. Um, I get my martial arts career started with karate, actually, Shodokan karate. And when you practice karate, you can pretty much identify the lineage and the, the origins because it's very well documented. And so you understand that fairly early on in your training. And jujutsu in the UK is not like that. It, you know, it was very difficult for me to really have a concept of where it all came from. So I guess that's where I'd always been interested in it. And um, as a scientist, you know, I'm trained, I, my, my role is in research. And, and once I get the scent, once I start researching something, I just, you know, I get really involved in it. And, and so I got really involved in trying to understand where British Jiu Jitsu came from, where it started. Mm. Yeah. And it's, that... it's, a bit, it's an interesting. Is that your so the article that in question is is about the the, the setting up of, of the first dojos and the first crowd of people who were around figures like um, like um, Barton Wright and taught figures like um, uh, Edith Garud. Um, uh, it, it, is that is that the main area of your focus? Like the moment it arrives in Britain um, and and those first decades of of of, of spread. So in my opinion, I think that's one of the most interesting areas because there was so much happening and it was so new. Uh, and there was a real kind of fusion with other. So Barton Wright obviously kind of took the jujutsu of, of the Japanese, but he also had Savat. He also had uh, cane fighting, boxing. He kind of threw a lot together. So it was a really interesting time. And he pitted the, the Japanese practitioners he had in his dojo or in his club. He pitted these against the best wrestlers. And you got this kind of movement in the music halls that was really popular where they would take on all comers, uh, wrestlers of all different styles, which was, which was also very popular in England and the UK at that time. Mm. And they would tour, they would tour the, the length and breadth of the UK doing these music hall shows. And I mean, the, the rules were weighted in their favor um, so their opponents had to wear a jacket and so on, so they could really apply their techniques, but they were using techniques that hadn't been seen before, and the public just marveled at their abilities. They were typically much smaller, the Japanese jiu-jitsu practitioners were typically much smaller in stature than your average British uh, wrestler, so the fact that they could beat them and throw them and tap them out was, was really something to behold to the British public. So it's, there's a lot of excitement in the newspaper articles around that time. And I think it's that, the, the, there was a big expansion and interest in it. So I think that period is very interesting for, for me. And, it's, and it stays interesting. Of course, you have the interruptions of the world wars, um, which kind of really disrupts, I think, the passage of jujitsu uh, um, th through, British society, um, but in both wars you have British soldiers being taught jiu-jitsu techniques as their unarmed combat. So I think it does persist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, um, a lot of your research is based in in newspaper archives, and you've you've searched for the stories about these shows and these characters. Um, is there much? I've never. I'm I'm 
I am about to begin more newspaper research on, on the emergence of these um, practices in Britain. But what's the, the environment like around just like wrestling or, or, or fighting generally, like, like sport or competitive fighting? Because we know that there's news reports about these spectacular Japanese guys, these little Japanese guys beating big burly wrestlers. What is, is, there, is wrestling a huge deal? Is it reported in the press or is it just when there's something unusual happens that it gets reported? I think at that time, you could, in the late Victorian Edwardian, era wrestling was very popular and um I, I think there are reports of it i think it explodes when the japanese come and you have these contests these spectacular contests i haven't done a great deal of research into other types of wrestling other than they were around and popular at the time when jiu-jitsu appeared mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and i i guess so i have found some interesting things from the newspaper reports. A lot of my research has also come from just collecting stuff. Right. So on eBay, for example, I can collect, you know, books from that period. So William Bankier, who then took on Yuki Otani and Raku Yaneshi after they'd left Barton Wrights, he wrote a book in 1904, which is very informative, full of stories. And Yaneshi and, and Tani also had their own books from that time. So you can learn a lot from, from the literature that these guys produced. Mm -hmm. Percy Longhurst, who was a wrestler, a champion wrestler, fought uh, Tani, one of the Japanese, in 1900, and as part of one of Barton Wright's shows. And he then trained with them subsequently and became a prolific author on the subject. So there is a lot of literature out there that you can collect and gives you an insight into that time. Yeah. So Percy Longhurst, I've read I've read some of his works and he it's interesting because at first uh, in these first publications, um, especially of the, the British authors, they'll talk about the, Jap the Japanese tricks. It's like not it's not an art or a style. It's like there's some tricks that these guys know. Um, and they just think, well, we should learn them. We should learn these tricks. And they're talking, I guess they're talking about wrist locks and, and different kinds of throws and holds. But it's not regarded as a style or an art in the way that we think now, you know, you immerse yourself, like you don't go to a jujitsu class to learn some tricks. You, you go to, to, to learn the style that you understand is going to take you possibly a decade to really get anywhere with. Um, I mean, what do, you, what, what do you make of that kind of dimension of it? Like the wrestlers just wrestle and they, they just keep adding tricks to their repertoire. Is, is that just, something that-, that you're Let me just with? adjust my blind here. Thanks. All right, okay. <laughs> So, Perfect. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think in terms of a British type of wrestling, a lot of the, the locks and the chokes and the strangles and so on would be deemed um, as unfair, you know, that's, a, that's fighting dirty, whereas jiu-jitsu, of course, is fighting dirty. It's mm. a matter of life and death, whereas wrestling is a sport. And I think when it started to mix with the sporting aspects of the British culture, a lot of these tricks weren't really, they weren't known because they were, you know, they were tricks you would use to kill somebody rather than to win a sporting contest. Mm -hmm. and, so they, um, they probably weren't recognised by your average British wrestler. Yeah. But a lot of the throws, a lot of the throws, you can see things like the flying mare, for example, which comes from wrestling. Isn't that dissimilar from, say, an Aggie shoulder throw from judo, mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu? So mm -hmm. A lot of the ways of throwing people and controlling people will have evolved. Mm -hmm. There are only so many ways that the bodies can efficiently throw each other. They will have similarities, but these locks and chokes and strangles do add the extra dimension, the tricks that the Japanese took with them. And what what's the kind of... The, the the transactions that are taking place because I, I heard and I, I don't remember where I read this I probably read it somewhere very very unreliable but that that um, you know the, that jujitsu and then judo practitioners would be sent to places like the, 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 to come to learn like Cumbrian wrestling and things like this and I remember talking to a historian I was talking to Oleg Benesh who's a historian at York University and he 
And I said, isn't it, it's just a crazy thought to think that in the early 1900s, you're getting these like, you know, like three or four Japanese guys going to Cumbria. Like, you know, you picture Cumbria as just sheep and fields and to, to learn wrestling. And he said, no, no, th in, in the 19th century, there was a hell of a lot more of a transaction between, between Britain and Japan than we think. I mean, you know, the, they were buying ships and they were, they, were, they, were, they were companies sending people here and there. So was, was the transaction two-way, do you think, in terms of, of, of what's being learnt and <clears throat> is our Western wrestling styles having any impact on, on the Japanese practice or is it one way? Okay, so I, I have started to look into this a little bit, and it is a very interesting area. I had heard, or had sorry, had read somewhere that twenty percent of the locks and holds, and oh, sorry, the holds in judo have a wrestling origin. And I know that Jigoro Kano, when he was devising judo, was influenced by Western wrestling, and throws like kata garuma, for example, which is the shoulder wheel, where you mm. take them over your shoulders. There, there's some thought that that would have been uh, wrestling mm. originally. So I think there's definitely, I think there is definitely um, an influence of Western wrestling on on judo. Okay. And British, okay. um, British jiu-jitsu. So, you know, so I think when the likes of Tani and Yuneshi came, they weren't students of the Kodokan as such. Mm -hmm. But the early, if you look at their books and the, the early um their early work they clearly had a knowledge of judo mm -hmm. and Janeshi, for example he one of his students emily diana watts wrote a book on nagi no kata which was devised by the kodakan um, so they, they clearly had a knowledge and appreciation of this mm -hmm. and i think it's largely what they practiced mm -hmm. even though they weren't formally kodakan judo students so i think you did have this fusion or this mixing and that their students, people like Percy Longhurst, when they taught judo or wrestling, it would have been a mix. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of the and the, the, the common knowledge, the common sense is that the first jitsu, the first use of jitsu in Britain was bartitsu, was the itsu, it was in itsu of bartitsu. So was it the case that, um, that bartitsu was really the first time that we'd learned terms like like about jujitsu, we had that whole Japanese suffix on the end, or, or was jujitsu a term that you've encountered in earlier texts? There was a, there was a text um, in a, 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 a journal called the Idler, and in 1882, mm. there is an article on judo stroke jujitsu. Um, and the author was helped by a member of the Japan Society in London. Mm -hmm. It's essentially an article on judo, um, which at the time, the, uh, in those days, the terms judo and jujitsu were used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. So it does appear in the UK before Barton Wright. Um, Barton Wright spent a couple of years in Japan and then came back and introduced Bartitsu. Mm -hmm. Which is and he popularized it. He started he started the movement really. Mm. It wasn't unknown before yeah. Barton Wright. And what do you think is the likely quality of 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 Barton Wright's uh, skills? I mean, I mean, how much can you learn in a couple of years after work or before work? You know, because he was what a, a railway engineer or something. I mean, I mean, yeah. You can, if you've got no social life and you devote your out of work life to training, then okay. But what I mean, what's your What's your sense of his of his standard? I think he was a man who was accustomed to fighting, to the fighting arts. And I do believe he tested himself in contests with wrestlers. I don't think he was anything like the level of his Japanese um, colleagues, okay. Tani and Yuneshi. But even Tani and Yuneshi, Tani described himself as a third rate jiu-jitsu exponent right he, he, he even acknowledged that in japan there were people far superior to him even though in the music halls in the uk he was beating everyone mm. and he, he did beat everyone until a fellow japanese taro miyaki came and beat him mm. 
and Miyake was considered to be very good. All right. Okay. The extent that actually gave up during the contest. Okay. And how how influential nationally was this stuff that was taking place? So um, it, the first dojos were set up in London. There was the Bartitsu, and then there was the, there were several other things. How nationally what was happening? I mean, was it was it just when they toured, or were people going, oh, I'll set up a a dojo, or I'll set up a club? I mean, how did how did that spread happen? In, in your to your best of your knowledge. So it's, there's a lot of stuff that there's just very little documentation, but you can find individuals. Certainly in the newspaper archives, the Japanese exponents did tour nationally. And Taro Miyake, for example, went as far as Aberdeen several times. We know that in 1907 or 8, they were a lot of a group of the Japanese, including Mitsuo Maeda, who subsequently moved to Brazil to teach judo. Mm -hmm. We're at the Highland Games in Inverness. So it did spread as far north as that, and people will have seen it. There were wrestlers who competed against the Japanese the Japanese instructors mm -hmm. and who subsequently um, became teachers. So Bruce Sutherland in Edinburgh, for example. Um, Harry Hunter, who had been a in the Navy and had been based in Yokohama, learned some jiu-jitsu there, came back and started a dojo in Liverpool in the 1920s. Um, some of the students, the early students in the London dojos, I've seen literature where they've ended up in Northumberland and various other places. So mm. I think the concentration was in London, mm. certainly, but they did tour and influence the practice in other places. And some of those early students then ended up in different places, but it is a bit patchy. Mm -hmm. And um, the sense that I get of the history of it is that it's a bit like it's a bit like waves coming in, that like the tide coming in on the beach, because you get the first like Bartitsu is a is a is a term that's kind of relatively well known. If you look, there's like hundreds hundreds upon hundreds of newspaper uh, stories and entries about Bartitsu. Um, I know this because the Bartitsu Society shared with me their their files, I and mean, there's just like so much written at the turn of the century, and it's in Conan Doyle, of course, in Sherlock Holmes, of course. But then that gets washed away when the next wave comes, which is the term jujitsu, and then overwhelmingly, whoosh, judo comes in later on in the century, and it just just squashes out, and judo becomes like the dominant term for a long time, for really Japanese martial arts, I think, I think, is, would that reflect your understanding of it? That it, it just becomes the dominant overarching term. And then later on, you hear about karate and, and, and so on. But, but really it's like small wave Bartitsu, larger wave Jiu-Jitsu, massive wave Judo for a long time through the 20th century. Yeah, so I think what happened was um, the, some of the very, the top exponents who were practicing jiu-jitsu in the UK, such as Yuki Otani, who had led really that wave of jiu-jitsu you talk of, he and another Japanese jiu-jitsu exponent called Gunji Koizumi um, became judoka, essentially. So they started the Budokai in 1918, and in 1920, they converted to Kodokan when Jigoro Kano came to visit. Hmm. And I think at that point, you know, Whilst when I said judo was what was kind of being predominantly practiced anyway, so they had a, a working knowledge of it. That term then, under the auspices of the Kodokan in London, really drove uh, the expansion of judo as the predominant way to practice jujitsu, and that's how it became known. And there were other smaller groups that kept the term jujitsu and judo um, and jujitsu. Mm -hmm. however it was described um, and some of them may or may not they, I mean they had a very close relationship to what was happening in London with Gunji Koizumi and Yuki Otani I think they were still regarded as and pre-war judo was still very much a martial art mm. compared to to the sport it is today so but yeah I think it was around 1920 and then it's just it took over post-war there were then other groups that set up so you have, you know, the British Jiu-Jitsu Association, British Jiu-Jitsu Federation, in addition to the, the judo, the well-established judo federations. Mm 
Okay. And what style? What style did you settle on? Did you? Is it a Japanese style that you do, or is it is it a Brazilian or? So the style I practiced. So when I when I took it up, I didn't know what it was, um, but the style I practiced uh, is a Western style, and I think it's something that's kind of evolved through the various permeations of judo and jiu-jitsu in the UK and it was really kind of formalized in Liverpool in the 1950s by a man called James Blundell who then organized the syllabus and that then went through the British Jiu-Jitsu Association. Okay. <laughs> okay so it's, a, it's does it still use Japanese terms or does it does it did it just does it just use British terms? Because we, when we, I used to do Chinese martial arts, and we had debates about whether we should even bother using the Chinese names for things because um, because no one in no one in the group spoke Chinese, no one read Chinese. Um, but we decided that we probably should stick with the um, with the terms because that would enable us to communicate with the wider world in terms of like what this technique is, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, is that the status of Japanese within a British Jiu Jitsu system or? So it, it, I think it varies from club to club. In general, when I learned the style initially, there was no Japanese terms used. Right. I, in hindsight, with some retrospect and having studied the history, I think it's valuable to actually learn the Japanese terms to understand, because within the name, there's not just this is the move, there's also the underlying principle behind it a lot of the time. And you can understand then a little bit more about the technique. Mm -hmm. And like you say, it, it can be used to, to train, you know, any, you, those techniques have the same name wherever you go in the world if you use the Japanese terminology. So mm -hmm. I think there's real value in keeping the original and uh, nomenclature yeah, um, the, I, I mean, there's a, I, I know a, um, a, a guy, a Polish guy who, who um, when he came to Britain, he was a brown belt in judo and he'd been a brown belt for a very long time, even though he was obviously like one of the best, the absolute best guys in the club. And I said to him, why, why, aren't, why haven't you taken your black belt? And he said, because I can't remember the names and I have to learn the names. And I said, but aren't they just Japanese? And he said, yeah, but the Japanese is different. <laughs> so the way that he'd, the way they would say it and write it in Poland was very different to the way it would be said and written in Britain. I always thought that was a marvelous little like, you know, yeah, we're using the same terms, but they're different. <laughs> um, but here's a question. Um, so you are a, a professor of um, neuroinflammation. Um, does do you see any connections between your interest in martial arts and 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 kind of neuropsychology or or, or or neurobiology or however you would term it? I think, to be honest, not really. It's they're quite different. I guess having a scientific understanding can help understand, um, you know some of the, the the atemi strikes to various pressure points and so on you can you can make sense of why that would work um but not but not to any greater or lesser degree really that than than if i wasn't i think having being a scientist and, and, and a researcher i think is is probably more valuable in studying the history and that i have those research skills and mm -hmm. i'm able to organize information um, mm. I think that's probably where the, the value for me has been with, with, with that. Okay. And of course, being a scientist, you know, ultimately what you need to do is, is cut through the noise and get to the actual source of the truth of, of what's going on. I think, you know, that's what I try to do. So this article on the early, the, the Golden Square Dojo, I think, is, is a really kind of accurate Mm. reflection of, of that time okay yeah i was just thinking that there's that, i mean for me there's a big when i'm inter my interest in martial arts kind of mushes into my interest in in being healthy and staying fit and everything and there's a new word that's kind of floated into that realm mm. 
you know, there, there, there used to be words like mindfulness and, and, and the benefits that mindful meditation and so on has. The new word that I found cropping up in more and more contexts, more and more amateur contexts and martial arts contexts, the words uh, is precisely the word inflammation. And people are doing all sorts of health related practices like, you know, ice baths and swimming in cold water. And they talk about, is that the same inflammation or as, as neuroinflammation? You know, this kind of like, if you submerge yourself in an ice bath for 10 minutes, then it's going to reduce your inflammation. Is that the same deal? Or is that, is that any connection with, with what you're a professor of? So, inf yeah, so inflammation is, um, is basically your body's first response to an infection or an injury. So it's, it's part of your immune system. Mm -hmm. It's part of how you, you stay healthy. And so when, there's inf when you have inflammation and you shouldn't have, generally it's very unhealthy. And that's the root cause of diseases, joint diseases, such as arthritis and, and so on. And also in the brain where I study, diseases like Alzheimer's disease are driven by inflammation. So we try, so reducing it in those contexts is very good. Mm -hmm. In terms of sport, um, obviously, if you do a lot of exercise, the levels of inflammation increase. And of course, you can have wear and tear, which can be inflammation related. And if you get struck in the head, you know, boxers will have a lot of brain inflammation after a boxing match or a sparring match. So, and this can, of course, lead to brain injury further on. Mm -hmm. um, so in those contexts, reducing inflammation is very good. Reducing inflammation if you're healthy, I don't really, there, there might be some scientific basis for that that I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but a lot of people will, might just throw the term inflammation around thinking that this is something we're trying to reduce and actually, you know, is an ice bath going to actually reduce inflammation if you're a healthy person without any inflammation? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, in terms of your your future research, will there do you, do you anticipate any connections between your your professional life and your your um, your kind of personal amateur interest in history or your 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 interest in martial arts, or is it going to be two different different things? You're going to come on from work and you're going to start research in a different era or something. Is it always going to be different, or is there any connection? So it's quite nice. It's quite nice actually to do something different, and I think so. You know, when I, I I spend a lot of time obviously at work studying the brain and studying the immune system and how they interact, and then to, when I come home to be able to just switch into something else, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of fun. And actually, I find without any, so it's not my job. So I, there's no pressure associated with my research into jiu-jitsu it's just fun you know i'll just do it for fun and it's really interesting okay i was wondering when i was i was looking at your list of publications this morning on your website your work website and it's what it's I've, I've probably over the years i've just learned to not read those types you know when you're doing a library search and all the scientific articles come i, I just don't my eyes don't see them anymore. But like I was, what a thought occurred to me, it was like, are you going to list your jujitsu article on your list of publications at work? <laughs> I think you should, but are you going to? You know, it's a, it's a funny, I, I have, I, I don't know, I wondered this and I, you know, because it's gonna be um, obviously to my scientific colleagues, then I, I can explain it. But of course, academic freedom. And when I, before I sent you this article, I. I spoke to the, the president at the university who, who was, had supervised my PhD and I said, am I allowed to do this? And she said, of course, you know, it's academic freedom. You, you, you're allowed to, to explore and do these things. So, um, so I, yeah, I might do. And it's actually, when it's, if it becomes formally accepted, I think it will be my hundredth peer reviewed publication. Yes, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this one to celebrate it's going to be so it's your hundredth peer-reviewed article and it's about it's about it's a kind of passion project and it's going to appear in the 10th issue of martial arts studies which is exactly five years after we began publishing so i think it, it's too 
it, it's too profound to, to not to know it. I mean, at my work, anything that gets lodged in on we call Orca, the, the open access thing, automatically goes, it'll appear on the website. So if the library accepts it as a valid publication, because it's been peer reviewed and everything, then it, so you know, maybe you should do the same, maybe you should. Uh, yeah. I think, so should, I think you should come out, you should definitely come out as a, as a martial arts scholar as well. You definitely should. Well, I think so, I, but you know, it's, it is a serious, you know, it, although it's a, it's a, it's a hobby, it's a passion outside work, it's a, it's a serious field of interest, you know, as, as you well know, it's, um, it's a scholar, scholarly place to work. Yeah. It is, and oh. so the, you know, and I, I have read some of the articles in your in your journal, Martial Arts Studies. There are some ter some terrific work. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's. We try to be in as broadly interdisciplinary or, or multidisciplinary as, as possible. We don't. We can't shade into anything that's close to science because we just don't have the disciplinary competence to to adjudicate on on the worth of something. So we tend to stay in the arts, humanities, and then social science-ish end of things. Um, but what's, what, what will be your next kind of uh, research period or research focus, do you think, when it comes to, to jujitsu or martial arts? So there's two areas. Um, the, the two things that are foremost in my mind is the, is the role or the relationship with the music halls and the variety theatre, because the programmes um, for the variety theory, we'd have all sorts of comedians, singers, and then you'd have this Japanese jiu-jitsu master taking on all comers. And it's really quite interesting how that period, I mean, it would have been great to be in the music halls and to see this. Um, and I think that was a really important component of the expansion and development of jiu-jitsu in the UK. So, I'm, so that's something I'm really digging into just now is the role of the music halls. And Another aspect that I'm very interested in are British weapons in Jiu-Jitsu. And in particular, I'm interested in the walking stick or the walking cane. Mm. Now, Barton Wright had Peter Vingy, um, the, the Swiss master of Lacan, come to his uh, club to develop this. But it was also, it was in the UK before that. There's literature really early British martial arts literature going back to the 1830s, where they talk about using umbrellas and using single sticks, you know, walking canes and self-defense. Mm. And after Pierre Vingy, some of his students took it on and it persisted. You can see walking stick techniques in jiu-jitsu classes throughout the eras of British jiu-jitsu mm. and, and Western jiu-jitsu. And it's, it's an interesting thing. So I'd like to really study I think the walking cane from its its use as a weapon for self-defense mm -hmm. in British martial arts before jiu-jitsu and then throughout that period. Okay. I think that's really interesting and it, it, it ties in with a, a, a lot of the research about the origins of, of things like southern Chinese martial arts which are which which are really closely connected with theatrical touring theatrical companies performance you know so there's a there's a lot of there are scholars who argue that a lot of the stuff that we see in chinese martial arts is essentially its birthplace was the theater and that's a lot of the reason why it looks like this sometimes it's connected with musical performance and dance and, and it but the other thing that i'm thinking at the same time is that is we know we well i don't but people now sit down and watch you know britain's got talent and there used to be the Royal Variety performance and all of these, all of these programs. And it's, it's just such a bizarre mishmash of different things. Like you'll hear a, you'll hear a child opera singer and then someone will be juggling fire and then someone, and it's just so much stuff. And it's, it's almost like the environment that the UFC was born in because the UFC was born at a time of so many new cable channels and these kind of crazy quests to find the next thing that might, that might work. And the UFC emerged like, oh, this this one works. We'll have that. And it's it's always in these eras or these contexts of complex choices and all of these options about these crazy new practices and crazy new things. And then something new is born from it. 
it's really fascinating. I think that'll be a great, a great line of research. I mean, these patterns are very interesting, aren't they? The fact that, you know, they kind of repeat themselves, but with different states of technology that it's, it's the same, it's the same evolutionary process that's throwing something out that captures, there's obviously something about jujitsu that captures people's imagination. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, definitely. That's really great. I'm really um, glad to have talked to you today. And um, yeah, thanks for taking the time. And um, maybe we will meet in the real world at some point and you can yeah, talk, so. talk me Thank about it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much.